I just want to start by saying that I wasn't born vegan and I wasn't even born vegetarian. You see, for almost 21 years of my life, I consumed meat, dairy and egg products. It's not just that I consumed them, I loved them, right? I loved how they tasted. I'd have them every single day of my life. I looked forward to the flavors and the textures. I looked forward to getting that nutrition and that satisfaction from consuming those products. I get Domino's pizza pretty much every single week, two for Tuesday. I'd always get Texan barbecue, I'd always get meat feast, and they'd always both come with extra mozzarella and cheesy stuffed crust as well. I went into my local KFC so often that the people who worked there knew me by my name and knew what my favorite order was, which was a Zinger box meal with extra hot wings. So when I went in, they say, oh, hi, Ed, you want your Zinger box meal with extra hot wings? And I'd be like, absolutely, please, as quick as you can. You see, I loved the flavor of these products. I really enjoyed them. I used to wear things made out of leather and wool and silk and down. I'd buy cosmetics like shampoos and shower gels without ever considering whether or not they were tested on animals. And going to the zoo was literally one of my favorite things to do. And I did it because I was an animal lover. I liked observing these animals. I thought it was a nice thing to do to see them. Um, I enjoyed seeing these animals. You see, this wasn't something, or veganism wasn't something that I was born with. The morality of veganism wasn't something that I was born with. It's something that I grew and educated myself on and learned more and more about. Now, everything started to change for me about five years ago. I was having a pizza with a friend and my friend was veggie and I, and I wasn't at this point. And I said to him, should we get bacon on the pizza? And he said, no. And I said, why not, right? Why would you not want to get bacon on pizza? I mean, bacon belongs on pizza. Can you even call it pizza if there's not bacon on top? And he said, Ed, I don't think an animal should die for a pizza topping. I said, what are you talking about? These animals are bred for that purpose. We give them life, they give us bacon. Bacon is life, right? That's why I used to say I was one of those bacon is life people. But ironically, bacon is very much death. Now, at that point, I'd never once really contemplated why I consumed animals. I'd not ever really once contemplated why someone wouldn't eat animals. The concept of just consuming animals was so normal. It was so natural. I thought it was necessary. It's what I did every day. So why would I question it? Now, four years ago, around four years ago, May 2014, I came across this story in the news. It was in the BBC News. It was about a truck carrying 7,000 chickens crashing just off the M62 near Manchester. And it really disturbed me, this story, because the journalist was talking about how hundreds of these animals had died on impact. In fact, I think in total, it was 1,500 of the birds died on the impact alone. But what disturbed me even more was that there were hundreds more of them that were alive but they were mutilated. They had broken bones and broken wings. Their faces were literally hanging off. And I saw pictures of it. Their faces were hanging off. Their combs were hanging off. Their beaks were hanging off. And they were alive. And they were suffering. And they were in pain. And I remember reading this article and thinking how horrible it must be for these animals, what terrible suffering they must be enduring. But at that very moment, it dawned on me that in my fridge, there was chicken breasts and chicken thighs and yesterday's KFC. And therefore, I was a hypocrite for feeling sorry for these animals when the only reason they were there in the first place was because I ate their flesh and therefore demanded that they be slaughtered on my behalf. So that moment when I was reading that article caused me to question, question my lifestyle, question my actions, question things I'd never thought to question before. It made me say to myself, how do I morally justify doing these things to animals? Are my taste buds more important than their life? I was a hypocrite for feeling sorry for these animals because they were there because of me. So I made the choice that day to change my lifestyle, to change what I ate, I became veggie, and then I learned more about the dairy and egg industries and eventually became vegan. Now, the purpose of what I'm about to say to you and the purpose of this film isn't to make you feel bad. It's not to say that you're a bad person because quite simply, that isn't true. It's not to say that you're consciously living an immoral lifestyle because again, quite simply, that isn't true. The purpose of what I'm gonna say and the purpose of the film is to make you question yourself in the same way that, that truck story or the truck crash story made me question myself. It's to make you maybe question the lifestyle that you've been living all your life and make you ask the questions that I asked myself. Are my taste buds more important than the life of an animal? How do I morally justify taking the life of an animal if it's unnecessary? These are the questions, the rhetorical questions that I was forced to confront within myself and hopefully maybe you'll question yourself with. Now, if you get an idea and you put that idea into society long enough, it becomes a societal norm. Now, if you keep fueling that societal norm over time, it forms part of society's culture. You pass culture on generation to generation, it becomes tradition. 
Now, we need only look across the world right now to see that culture and tradition are not good benchmarks for morality. Let's just consider first off that in some cultures across the world, it's acceptable to treat a woman as less than a man. We would hardly consider that to be moral. In some cultures, it's acceptable to perform female genital mutilation, but again, we would hardly consider that to be moral, even though it's very much a traditional practice. Let's apply this logic and way of thinking to a situation where it's non-human animals that are being oppressed. The Yulin Dog Meat Festival is an annual festival where tens of thousands of dogs and cats are bred into existence, they're mutilated, they're killed, and ultimately, they're eaten. Is it therefore moral to kill and eat a dog if doing so forms part of the community's culture or tradition? What about in Bocknell, where again, an annual festival where tens of thousands of dogs and cats are killed? Is that moral? What about in Japan, where every year they slaughter thousands of dolphins? Is that moral because it's traditional? Or in the Faroe Islands, where every single year they slaughter thousands of pilot whales? Again, is that moral because it's cultural? But if it's not moral for other cultures to kill dogs and cats and whales and dolphins, why would it be moral for us to kill cows and pigs and chicken and sheep and ducks and geese and all the animals that we kill and consume in this country? And can we really justify that behaviour by saying it's something we've always done or it's cultural or it's traditional? Now, it always strikes me so strange that we have this moral hypocrisy in society where we view some animals as different to other animals. Why is that? Why is it that so many of us in society get so angry and upset at the notion of a dog being hurt and killed, but laugh at those that get angry and upset at the notion of a pig or a cow or a chicken being killed? The Winter Olympics were just on in South Korea, and I found it so jarring because people were outraged that in South Korea they have a dog meat trade. People were calling on a boycott of the Winter Olympics, saying that some of the athletes shouldn't go because they have a dog meat trade, because they kill and eat dogs. There were some of the athletes there that actually rescued some of the dogs from the dog meat trade, and they were called heroes. They were seen as heroes, as animal rescuers, as lovers of animals. But while they were rescuing those dogs, they were going back and eating chickens and cows and pigs. Why is it that we have this moral distinction? After all, all of these animals are alive. They all think, they all feel, they can all suffer, they can all show compassion and receive compassion. And most importantly, they all deserve to receive compassion. So what gives us the right? What gives us the right to arbitrarily point the finger and decide who lives and who dies? What gives us the right to inflict pain, suffering, and ultimately death onto an animal that wishes to avoid pain, suffering, and ultimately death? Now, one of the most commonly cited justifications that people use to try and excuse our consumption of animal products is the notion of a food chain. Now, food chains are incredibly important. They help maintain natural ecosystems. They help maintain natural population sizes of wild animals. Inherently, ecosystems help maintain the ecology of the areas of the world in which they exist. They are fundamental to the survival of those ecosystems. Now, what we do to animals when we selectively breed them, when we forcibly impregnate them, when we take their babies away from them, when we mutilate them, when we exploit them for what isn't ours, like their milk and their eggs, when we take them to slaughterhouses, hang them upside down and cut their throat has nothing to do with a food chain. It resembles nothing like you would see in the natural world. It has nothing to do with maintaining healthy population sizes or maintaining the ecology of environments. What we do to animals cannot be compared to a food chain because it couldn't be further detached from a food chain. Now, if I brought a pig into this room now, say a live pig, and I said to you, kill this animal using what you were biologically given, because all natural animal eaters in the wild kill the prey that they eat using what they were biologically given, which is their claws and their canines. So if I said to you, kill this pig using what you were biologically given, how many of you think you'd be able to do that? I mean, let's be honest, when you try to maul that pig, that pig would probably roll over and accept a little tickle off you. And let me tell you that pigs absolutely love belly rubs. If anyone's ever spent time with pigs, you can vouch for this. They love belly rubs. So when you were trying to maul that pig, that pig would roll over and accept a belly rub right there in front of you. You see, the utensils that we have for killing are very rudimentary and very crude. We're not effective predators. But let's say, in this, for the sake of argument, that you do kill that pig. And now in front of you is not only a dead pig, but that pig carcass is now open. You've effectively butchered the pig. And in front of you lays the open carcass of that once 
living pig. Are you going to eat the raw meat? What about the organs, like the intestines and the cartilage and the tendons and the ligaments and the brain, and all that nasty stuff that we don't like to think about? Are you going to eat that? Are you going to eat around that? What always strikes me as strange is that when people see these parts of animals, they say that it puts them off their food. When people see graphic content like this, they often say to me, I don't want to see that, it'll put me off my food. Why? Why would seeing the process of how meat and animal products turn up on your plate put you off eating them? If you were naturally meant to eat animals, not only would you be able to watch them being killed, you'd be able to kill them yourself. Yet so many of us feel the opposite of hunger when we see animals being killed. We feel repulsed, we feel angry, we feel sad, we feel frustrated. We don't understand why they're suffering so much. If we were natural animal eaters, this wouldn't phase us at all. Yet that's one of the most common things that people say to me. I don't want to watch the documentary because it'll put me off my food. Why is this? How many stories do we see in mainstream media, but also in social media, of people, say, eating a KFC and they find like a piece of chicken brain in their KFC and they're outraged, they're so angry, they tweet at KFC and they say, KFC, how dare you? I found a piece of chicken in my dead chicken meal. In fact, there was a headline that said something like, students find dead chicken parts in their fried chicken. <laughs> well, what else are you expecting to find? It's a fried chicken box meal. Of course, you're going to find dead chicken parts. But you find a piece of brain or a piece of kidney or something that you didn't expect to find, and all of a sudden you find that repulsive, or they find it repulsive, and it puts them off their food. Is that not strange? Why do we find the body parts of animals abject if we think that we're supposed to eat them and that we're naturally designed to eat them? Say I bring a cow into this room now, and I present you all with a freshly sharpened knife. And I say, who of you will cut the throat of this cow? Would any of you volunteer to do so? Say instead of a cow, it's now a six month old lamb that I bring into this room. And I say, who of you will decapitate this lamb, cut their leg off and have a lamb shank? Would any of you do so? More importantly, let's say someone did volunteer to do so. How many of you would object? How many of you would oppose that person killing the animal, stop them, or at the very least turn away, walk out and pretend it's not going to happen? Say you're walking down the road and you see someone beating and abusing a dog, do you step in? Do you intervene? Do you try and stop them? Or at the very least, do you call the police? Now, say instead of a dog, it's a pig that's been abused, killed, and beaten in front of you. Do you still object? Do you still intervene? Do you still try and save that pig's life? At the very least, do you still call the police? Now, say that pig that's been abused in front of you is now being abused behind a wall where you can no longer see them. Does that now make it moral? Is the killing moral if it's out of sight and out of mind? Or is unnecessary killing always morally reprehensible? How many of us would oppose seeing an animal being killed in front of us, but go home and eat fried pig flesh, fried cow flesh, or a lamb leg? You see, as humans, we have something called moral agency. Inherently, this is what it all boils down to. Now, moral agency means that we are able to make decisions based on a notion of right and wrong, but importantly, it means we can be held accountable for the decisions that we make. Now, animals in the wild can't be held accountable for the decisions that they make. That's why lions and tigers and bears are not good role models for our morality. They kill out of necessity. They're obligate carnivores. They have to eat animal flesh to survive. We don't. And because we don't, our moral agency dictates that we are obliged to do or to purchase the product that contains the least amount of suffering. But it also means that if we choose to buy a product that contains suffering, we can and we should be held accountable for the action that we make. I want to do a little thought experiment. And the thought experiment goes, there's a cot with a baby in it. And with this baby in the cot, there's a live bunny rabbit and a strawberry. Which one does the baby eat and which one does the baby play with? Think about it this way. The FBI states that most serial killers began their life harming animals when they were children. Ted Bundy harmed and abused animals when he was a child. Jeffrey Dahmer harmed and abused animals when he was a child. Why is it that leading criminologists and psychologists look at children who harm animals when they're young as potential red flags for humans who may one day grow up to harm other humans? After all, a lion teaches their children to kill. A tiger teaches their children to kill, a jaguar teaches their children to kill, and yet for some reason we discourage our children from killing. Why is this? 
because it goes against our innate compassion. Now imagine in that cot, imagine if the baby tried to eat the bunny rabbit, right? We think, well, that child should probably be looked after, right? We think there's something wrong with the child if they went to eat the animal. And yet when they grow up, that's precisely what they do do. They eat the animal, right? So why is it that we don't like to see children harming animals? Now imagine if every child that was born into this world Imagine if they were taught that the life of a chicken should be valued with the same respect that we give to the dogs that we cherish in our home or indeed even to our own self. Imagine if every child that was born into this world was told to view the life of a fish in the ocean, a fish they'll never meet, a fish whose life may seem inconsequential. Imagine if that child was taught that that fish should be allowed to live their life without human inflicted pain and exploitation. How would that child ever grow up to harm or oppress another human based on entirely superfluous and irrelevant reasons like race or sexuality or ethnicity or whatever ridiculous reason it is that we choose to oppress each other over? How would that child ever grow up to harbor hatred to other humans if they were taught that all life was precious, that all life should be treated with respect, dignity and compassion and should be allowed the basic fundamental right to live that life? Now the animal agriculture industries they know that what we see in this footage and that what we see online is shocking and that it upsets us and that it offends us. That's why they don't show us the truth. That's why they give us marketing labels and ploys to distract us from the reality of what is really going on. Now, one of the best examples of this is free range. This is something that I used to really buy into. I thought that buying free range eggs was an ethical thing to do. You see, when we see a box of free range, egg, free range eggs in the supermarket, what we do is we attribute our ideals of freedom onto that box of eggs. Now, freedom to us means being able to live the life that you want to live. Do the things that come naturally to you. Spend time with your friends and your family if that's what you want to do. But most importantly, freedom to us means living without fear, living in peace, living in harmony, living without oppression, without injustice, living without pain. So when we see that box of free range eggs in the supermarket, we say those hens must have lived a good life. They must have done the things that came naturally to them, spent time with their friends and family if that's what comes naturally to them. But most importantly, we say those hens lived a life without oppression, without injustice, without fear, and without pain. We know that that is not true. We know that that is a lie. We know that free range hens come from hatcheries where the males are gassed and macerated as soon as they are born. We know that the female chicks are often de-beaked and placed into barns where they barely have any room to move and where many will never see the sunlight or breathe the fresh air until the day that they die. We know that all free range hens end up in a slaughterhouse with a knife being pulled across their throat. Make no mistake, there is no freedom in free range. There's another thing we get told, humane slaughter. It's acceptable and moral to kill an animal if it's done in a humane way. So I could ask you the question, how do you humanely take the life of an animal? But instead, let's think about it. The word humane means having or showing compassion or benevolence. So instead of me asking you that question, let me rephrase it a little bit and ask you, how do you compassionately, benevolently or humanely take the life of an animal that does not want to die for an unnecessary reason? You can't. Humane slaughter is an oxymoron. It can't ever exist because we can never justify taking that life of an animal when they don't need to die. And therefore we can never do it compassionately or benevolently. Another thing we often get told is happy cows produce happy milk. This is something we're gonna hear a lot more in the future, I guarantee you. Happy cows produce happy milk. Let's think about that for a, quest like for a second. Let me ask you a series of questions. Is the cow happy when she's forcibly impregnated? Is she happy when her baby is taken away from her? Is that mother happy? when her baby is taken away from her? Is that mother happy when she's exploited for what she naturally produces for her child? Is she happy when she's loaded into a truck or a trailer and taken to a slaughterhouse? Is she happy when the bolt gun is placed against her head and the knife pulled across her throat? Again, make no mistake, there is no happiness in the dairy industry. There is no right way to do the wrong thing. And exploiting animals because it is unnecessary will always be the wrong thing and therefore there is no right way to do it. Do not believe the labels and the lies and the adverts and the propaganda and the scams of these industries that seek to make money from you. 
They operate on supply and demand. The only way they can function is if people buy these products and people aren't going to buy these products if they know the truth behind them. So instead they lie to us to make us buy something that otherwise we would not want to buy because then they make money from us. Then they can profit from us. Then they can profit from the exploitation of animals. It is a lie. They have vested interests. Remember that when you see those labels and those pictures of happy animals. Those animals are suffering, they're in pain, and they will be until the day that they die. So the question often becomes, we agree, or most of us agree, that what happens to animals is wrong. And perhaps it is immoral. So instead of abolishing the industries, why don't we just improve the systems? Why don't we just make the farms humane? Why don't we make free range mean free? Now the reality is, even if we were environmentally and economically able to give all of these animals that we consume big green lush pastures, open fields, and allow them to do what comes naturally to them, even if we found a system where we didn't have to take their babies away from them, where we didn't have to mutilate them, where we didn't have to forcibly impregnate them, we will always, always, always have to take their life from them. That is a reality of animal exploitation. No matter what industry, their lives will always be taken away from them. And because of that, it's irrelevant what quality of life we give them. The moment that we take them to the yard or to the slaughterhouse to take their life, that is abuse and it cannot be morally justified. Do not buy into welfare. Welfare is not there for the animals. It's there for us to ease our conscience. You see, the animals don't care what labels they're given on the packets of flesh and secretions in a supermarket. They don't care if they're labeled organic or grass-fed or corn-fed or high welfare. Those labels do not safeguard the animals. They make us buy the product. They ease our conscience. Now, it always strikes me as strange that when we protest against something like the Yulin Dog Meat Festival, we don't say it's moral to take the life of a dog if it's done in a humane way. We don't say it's moral to take the life of a dog if they're given bigger cages or if they're labeled free range. We say taking the life of a dog for food is wrong and immoral and should be abolished full stop, no ifs, no buts. The petitions that we sign to end Yulin are not asking for bigger cages. They're not asking for different labeling. They're asking for an end to the dog meat industry and an end to the festival. So let me ask you, if the Labrador steaks that will be consumed in Yulin. If they came with an RSPCA approved seal, would that make it moral? If the minced chihuahua being consumed in Yulin, if that came with a red tractor approved seal, would that make it moral? If we brought all the dogs and all the cats that are being killed in Southeast Asia, if we brought them to this country, took them to British slaughterhouses and killed them in the exact same way that we kill the animals in this country, would that make it moral in your eyes? And if it wouldn't, why on earth would it be moral to kill the animals that we eat using these methods? If you have companion animals at home, say like a dog or a cat, a hamster, a rabbit, a gerbil, whatever animal it is, if you have an animal at home that you love and whose existence you cherish, if they needed to be put down and euthanized, would you take them to a slaughterhouse to have that done? And if you wouldn't, that should tell you all you need to know about how humane a slaughterhouse can be. Now, animals have one chance at life they have one existence. Who are we to take that one chance at life away from them because we value the taste of their flesh and their secretions? A meal to us lasts a matter of minutes, an inconsequential amount of time. It's a meal that we forget about as soon as we've finished. But that meal has cost the entire existence of an animal. We take their life for minutes of pleasure. What right do we have to do that? Not only as a species, but as individuals. Let me ask those questions again. Are my taste buds, or are our taste buds, more important than the life of an animal? How do we morally justify doing these things if it's unnecessary and if we don't need to? Now, as a vegan, I eat all the foods that I used to eat, all the foods that I used to enjoy, all the foods that I used to crave. I ate mac and cheese and spaghetti bolognese and lasagna and stir fries and curries and burritos and nachos and fajitas and tacos. I ate cupcakes and muffins and cheesecakes and chocolate cakes and sweets. I ate all the foods I used to love, all the foods I used to crave, but now I do so about harming animals. There's no dead animals, there's no exploited animal secretions, there's no gristle, there's no hormones, there's no antibiotics. They're made from plants. 
How simple is that, right? Sometimes people say to me, veganism is restrictive. Now, before I was vegan, I had one type of milk, cow's milk. Now I have oat milk and rice milk and soy milk and coconut milk and almond milk and cashew milk and hazelnut milk. I cook with ingredients and foods I'd never heard of before I went vegan. When I used to open my fridge, it would look like a morgue. It would just be dead chickens everywhere. Sometimes the occasional dead cow, maybe the occasional dead pig, predominantly dead chicken. Now when I open up my fridge, it's a garden. There's so many colors. There's such a beautiful array of foods I look forward to cooking. Going vegan encouraged me to reinvent the ways that I cooked. Cook with ingredients I'd never heard of. And because of that, I enjoy my food so much more than I ever did because it allowed me to reinvent my culinary experience and explore flavors I'd never considered as being something that I should eat. Now, the American Dietetic Association and the British Dietetic Association, which the largest bodies of diet and nutrition professionals in both countries, have categorically stated that a vegan plant-based diet is nutritionally adequate, healthy and safe for all stages of life, including pregnancy. What this inherently means is that every nutrient and every vitamin that we need to sustain our healthy life can be obtained on a plant-based diet. What that fundamentally means is that the exploitation of animals and the use of animals is completely unnecessary. It has no place in contemporary society. It should be abolished. There is no reason for it to exist anymore. We can survive on a plant-based diet, eating the foods that come natural to us, eating the foods our body was designed to eat. Now, the way that I like to simplify this is the largest and strongest animals on this planet, or the land animals, the elephant, the rhino, and the hippo, all have one thing in common. They're herbivorous. And hippos, ironically, have the largest canines of any land animal on this planet, and they are herbivorous. Okay, so that kind of lays to rest that myth that our canines provide us justification to tear flesh because the largest canines belong to a herbivore. Now, gorillas share 98% of our DNA, and their digestive tract is almost identical to ours. And apart from the occasional insects, again, they're herbivorous. Now, I'm not saying that we're gorillas or rhinos or hippos or elephants. But what I'm saying is that we do not need to eat meat or animal products to be strong and healthy. There's that expression that goes, man eats meat to be strong like an ox, forgetting that an ox eats grass. We do not need to eat animals to be strong. Now, if it wasn't so cruel, it would almost be ironic, but it is incredibly cruel. Our leading diseases and illnesses, diseases and illnesses that are currently affecting Western society, they've affected my loved ones, in fact. Things like heart disease, certain forms of cancer like breast and prostate and colon, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, dementia, hypertension, strokes, all of these diseases and illnesses can be massively attributed to our consumption of animal products. What is so important to note is that a simple switch to a plant-based vegan diet can not only prevent them, it can in fact reverse and treat some of them as well. There are people all over the West right now reversing and treating their heart disease and their type 2 diabetes by simply switching from animals to plants from animal proteins to plant proteins, from the foods that kill them to the foods that add quality and quantity to their life. Animal agriculture is also responsible for causing some of the worst environmental calamities that we are currently facing as a species. It's responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation system combined. It's responsible for up to 91% of Amazon rainforest destruction. It's also responsible for things like topsoil erosion, land desertification, and oceanic dead zones, which are vast areas of the ocean the devoid of all life. In fact, some scientists predict that by the year 2048, we could have fishless oceans. In our lifetime, we could have fishless oceans. Animal agriculture is responsible for the fact that we are in the next largest mass species extinction. Make no mistake, there is not a single living being alive on this planet today that is not negatively affected by our consumption of animal products. So I could ask you the question again, are our taste buds worth more than the life of an animal? But that doesn't even cover it all. The question should be, are our taste buds not only worth more than the life of an animal, worth more than our own existence, worth more than the life of this planet, 
in essence, worth more than every single living being on this planet? What sort of future do we want to leave behind for our children and our grandchildren? Do we want there to be a future left for our children and our grandchildren? The information is out there. The United Nations has stated that to avoid the worst effects of climate change, the world needs to shift to a plant-based diet. That's not a vegan activist telling you that. That's not a vegan organization. That's not vegan propaganda. That is the United Nations making a very stark and honest comment to people. So if you do not change the way that you live, and it is such a simple change, we will be the ones to feel the consequences. We will be the generations that feel the consequences of the actions that we make today. So I want to leave you with this series of questions. With the abundance of information that we have at our disposal every single second of every single day, with the fact that we can get our phones out and our laptops out and access not only this footage, but information that is unbiased and impartial, information that shows the truth about the health consequences of animal products, information that shows the truth about the environmental consequences of animal products, information these industries want to suppress. Is the fact that we can access that information, does that mean that we have the moral imperative to start asking ourselves questions? Like, is it time for me to make that change? Can I still claim to be willfully ignorant? Can I still bury my head in the sand and pretend that my actions do not have a negative consequence on others? Or do we have to begin to accept that every purchase that we make, no matter how inconsequential and small it may seem, has a profound effect on the lives of others. That every purchase we make in a supermarket is voting for a different world, a world where animals are still abused or a world where animals are no longer abused. Every single purchase that we make as individuals has a far-reaching consequence and a far-reaching impact that maybe we don't quite grasp, but we have to understand exists. So the question I want to leave you with, and the question I want you to think in your head, is what excuse do I still have? What moral justification can I still use? And if I can't think of one, or if you can't think of one, ask yourself this question. Is it time for me to make that change? Thank you so much for listening.